today we're going to be talking about the fall of a nation, the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah. And we're going to discover some lessons, I think, that we can apply to our own land. Let me give you some background on the nation of Israel as we talk about this uh, fall. Israel received its freedom from the land of Egypt April 15, 1445 B.C. They entered the Promised Land in April of 1404 B.C. And the reason it took 40 years was because they didn't trust the Lord when he told them they could go in and conquer the land. And so they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. At that time, Israel was ruled by judges. And uh, it wasn't until 1043 B.C. that they made Saul the king. In 1101 B.C., David became king, and then in 971 B.C., Solomon. When he died in 931 B.C., the nation divided. The north was called Israel, and the south was called Judah. In 722 B.C., Israel was captured by the Assyrians and carried away into captivity. Where they were carried, the Assyrians, is now the what we know as northern Iraq. And then in 723 years, in 723 years rather, they went from captive to captive. And they were in the promised land for those years, and they'd been promised great things, and they lost it all. In 586 BC, Judah is conquered by Babylon, which is part of Iraq today. And uh, that was some 136 years later after Israel had been captured and carried away. And God had promised Israel success and victory, and yet Israel lost it all. Why did they fail? And what lessons can we learn from their failure? And so we're going to ask, are there any applications that we can apply to our own lives today because of the things have happened to the nation of Israel. So we're going to consider three actions concerning God and Israel that will help us understand just what happened and maybe be able to make some applications to the land that we live in and what can happen. We're going to talk about what God did for Israel. Then we're going to talk about what Israel did against God. And then we're going to talk about what God did to Israel. First, what God did for Israel. First thing he did is he gave them liberty. In 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 7, the Lord, their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They were slaves for 400 years. They were a small group when they first went to Egypt, and now they're a group of about 2.2 million people. And they're slaves. And they cry out to God, and God sends a deliverer by way of Moses, and they are delivered from Egypt. You remember there were ten plagues and all sorts of things, and then the dividing of the Red Sea, and, and now they are free. God gave them their liberty. He also gave them something else. He gave them the law. In 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 13, they were instructed, Keep my commandments and my statutes. In accordance with all the law I commanded your fathers, and that I sent to you by my servants the prophets. Now the law to Israel was their constitution. That was the constitution of the nation of Israel, and therefore it was to be obeyed. It was given by God. He gave them the law. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 17, we see how this happened. Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. Now notice the response of the people to this. In chapter 19, verse 8, all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. So God said, I'm giving you my law, obey it. And the people said, we will. That was the beginning of the nation of Israel. Then he gave them the land. In 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 8, the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And then 
it says in Exodus chapter 3, this is what is taking place. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them out of the land of Egypt to bring them up out of that land. Notice this. He's given them the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, when you picture a land flowing with milk and honey, you're not going to get sticky feet and wet. Milk and honey was an indication that it would flourish with, with plants that would produce sap and honey and, and fruit and things like that. And milk, uh, the milk was the idea that it would be a green pasture land where, where you would have flocks and you would have, uh, be able to have many animals. And so they would be, in effect, wealthy in that day. That was the wealth of that day. So it was a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the, notice this, the Canaanite, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Prezerites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. All those people are driven out of the land so that Israel can have the land. And God had said that one day their iniquity would be full. They will reach a point where he'll tolerate them no more, and he will remove them from the land. That's all these different groups of people. And that's exactly what he does. And then he gave them his special love. He gave them his special love. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you. It wasn't because you had thousands and millions and you were just as huge. No, no. It wasn't because of that. And chose you, for you were the fewest of all people. You were just a dinky nation. But here's what he did. He did it, it says, but it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath he swore to your fathers that the Lord had brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God had made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now he's fulfilling those promises. That's why he did it. And he puts a special love. That means a special relationship with him and Israel. Again, in Deuteronomy 7.13, he will love you, bless you, and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your wine and your oil, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock in the land that he swore to your fathers to give to you. And then it says this, you shall be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your livestock. What a tremendous uh, promise. God gives this nation of Israel. What a great start. And you would have thought, man, they're really going to really take advantage of this. God has laid a special love on us, and he has promised to richly bless us. Let's see what Israel did against God. Let's find out where they went wrong. First, they despised their liberty. They despised their liberty. Judges chapter 17, verse 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. There was a constitution, but no king. So what does it say they did? They followed the laws of the Lord? No. Everyone did what was right, in his own eyes. They despised their liberty and they did what was right in their own eyes. It says the people of Israel in 2 Kings 17, 7 had sinned against the Lord their God who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. Now think about this. They had seen the magnificent plagues fall upon Egypt. They had seen the Red Sea divide. When they were entering the promised land, the Jordan divides. Wouldn't that be enough to say our God is God? But what do they do? It says they feared other gods. One of the great mistakes that people make is to fear other gods. And that's what they did. Verse 8, and they walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. What did they do? They adopted the practices and behavior of the nations that God kicked out because of their bad behavior. These people were sacrificing their children. These people were worshiping idols. These people were wretched. 
And so here is these promised people going to the promised land, practicing the deeds of the people that God is casting out. What they did is they despised their liberty, and they did what they wanted to do. And then they despised the law. In 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 13, Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with all the law that I commanded your fathers that I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Obey the law. I gave you a constitution. I gave you a way to live life right. What did they do? Verse 15. They despised his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and warnings that he gave them. They went after false idols and, be, and became false, and they followed the nations that were around them concerning whom the Lord had commanded them that they should not do like them. They were no longer a distinct and holy people, but they were a people doing their own thing and following the nations around them. Second Kings 17, verse 16, and they abandoned all the commandments of the Lord their God and made for themselves metal images of two calves and they made an Asherah and worshipped all the host of heavens and served Baal. You know, I, I have a particular dislike for statues made to imitate anything that represents God. The Bible is very clear about that. Sometimes when I'm driving through the neighborhood, I see a little statue with some flowers in front of it. And if I wasn't a spiritual person, I'd get out and kick it. But because of the restraints of God, I don't. However, there is not a statue that man can create or carve that can ever represent our God. None at all. And we should not have these kinds of things. God is very clear about that. And, they, and they, they don't belong. God said in Exodus 20, verse 3, You shall have no other gods before me. And we don't bow before anything except our God who created the heavens and the earth through the Lord Jesus Christ. So they despised their liberty. They despised the law. But here's next. They despised the land. In 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 9, and the people of Israel did secretly against the Lord. Now, did they think God really couldn't see it? They did secretly against the Lord, their God, things that were not right. They built for themselves high places in all their towns, from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves pillars and Asherah on every high hill and under every green tree. What a sad, sad state of affairs. They have the living God that delivered them from captivity, that did miracle after miracle and demonstrated his glory, that promised them great blessing. And what are they doing? They're building poles and statues all over. I've been to some countries where every corner has a statue on it and has a pole on it and some kind of thing to worship. And the most ridiculous thing I see is when they put food out to that stature. They do. I've watched it. And then I wonder who's taking that food at night. Because it's surely not the stature. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, and this is, this is what he's going to tell about the land and how the land was dis despised. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land I give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prime your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath, a solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. Now the Lord understood something, which we don't always. The land needed to replenish. The seventh year was a year of replenishing. The crops for those six years would carry them through that seven year if the land would replenish. But no, they were greedy. 
and they decided to plant on the seventh year. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 20. When they're brought into exile, listen to one of the reasons. He took into exile in Babylon those who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia. Notice this, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbath. 490 years they didn't keep a Sabbath. Every seven years they were supposed to have a Sabbath year. So that means 70 years they didn't keep it. All the days that it lay destitute, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. God collected on his Sabbath. And they, they despised their liberty. They despised their law. They despised the land. And worse, they despised their special love. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 15. They despised his statures and his covenant that he made with their fathers. He had put them in a special position. He said, I'm putting my special love upon you, my special grace, my special blessing. And what did they do? They despised it. They thought, big deal. And what a sad thing. And here's a nation that could have had it all. And they ended up losing it all because they despised their liberty, their law, their land, and God's special love. Now, what did God do for Israel? We saw how he blessed them. What did Israel do against God? We saw how they took everything God gave them and misused it and despised it. Now I want you to see what God did to Israel. Here's the first thing he did. He removed their liberty. He removed their liberty. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 18. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tribe of Judah only. Now let me say something. God didn't, isn't saying that he couldn't see where they are. Oh, I can't figure out where I put Israel. No, what he's saying is they're no longer in that special place of provision that he had provided for them. That wonderful land that was flowing with milk and honey. I want them out of there. And they, they lost their liberty. And then he restricted the practice of the law. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14, notice what it says. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and against your king. And so they're removed and they're in captivity. And eventually, a few years later, the temple is destroyed. Now let me ask you a question. How do they do their sacrifices? How do they do what God commanded them to do? How do they keep the law? They despised it. And because they despised it, God made it so that they can't keep it anymore, even today. Do you see any sacrifices happening today? The temple has been destroyed. They despised the law, and they long, no longer can practice it. And then next, he removed Israel from the land. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 23. Until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had spoken by all his servants, the prophets, so Israel was exiled from their own land to Assyria this day. They're gone. They've lost it. They didn't lose it because God couldn't keep them there. They lost it because they despised what God had done on their behalf. And because they went after other gods and they did their own thing, God kicked them out of the land. So he removed them from their liberty. He restricted the practice of the law. He removes them from the land. But here's the worst thing. He removed a special love from them. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 19. Judah also did not keep the commandments of the Lord, their God, but walked in the customs that Israel had introduced. Now notice this. 
And the Lord rejected, rejected all the descendants of Israel and afflicted them and gave them into the hands of plunderers until he had cast them out of his sight. Gone. Why? Because they blew the opportunities and the privileges that God gave them. And now they're out of his sight. Now they're in captivity. Now they're in a very bad situation, worse than even they were often in Egypt. God has carried them away. What's the result? Well, let's look at in the book of Romans for a moment and see some of the results. Romans chapter 11, verse 11. So I ask, the Apostle Paul is making a statement. So I ask, did they stumble, speaking to the Jewish people, in order that they might fall? By no means. Here's why God allowed this discipline to go on to the Jews. He says, rather through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. God is now doing a work mainly among the Gentiles. Some Jews are coming to Christ, and we thank God for that. But by and large, the Jewish nation rejects Jesus. They reject God, by and large, because the average Jewish person today is not what we would call conservative, but rather quite liberal. But what God is doing is saving people out of the Gentile nations. And you know why he's doing it? He wants Israel's eyes to open up to the truth. He wants Gentiles to come to the Lord and to see the grace of God, and he wants to shine grace upon those who come to the Lord so that those who walk through this experience have rejected the law, have rejected the Lord, have rejected, that he wants them to become jealous. Why? Because he still has a plan for Israel. Israel is God's prophetic people, and they will be in the plan of God, and one day the Messiah will come, and they whom they have wounded, they'll recognize, and they will repent. But right now he's using... Gentiles to bring them to that point of view as they see the grace of God move among us. Romans chapter 11, verse 15. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? And then verse 19 of Romans 11. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. I am able to understand and know the gospel, and especially because God is using me to draw the Israelites to him, the Jewish people to him. I have been grafted in. But he warns us, that is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. Don't you become an unbeliever. Don't you act like an unbeliever. Don't you adopt the customs of the world, but rather stay true to your walk with the Lord. And then he says, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. In other words, God can deal with us in the same way that he dealt with Israel, as people, as a nation, as a group of believers. He says in Romans 11:21 with this warning, for if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. In other words, as long as we as a people are walking with God, we will experience the hand of God and the blessing of God. But that can stop. In fact, in our nation, we're going to see in a moment what's happening. And we can see what's, what, what the, this word is coming true, even in our own lives. Romans 11, 22. None, now note then, the kindness and severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you. Notice, provided you continue in his kindness. Don't go the way that Israel went. Israel experienced the great blessings of God, the great mercy of God, the great forgiveness of God, and they went their own way. Now Gentiles are receiving the great blessing of God, the great forgiveness of God, but what's happening to the Gentiles? That's us as a whole, going their own way. If It's amazing how the church of Jesus Christ is turning away from the gospel. It's amazing. 
And why are they doing that? Because they're moving into the culture of the world. And because the culture of the world is pushing this direction or that direction, the church is now beginning to change its policy, which is, in effect, rewriting God's law. And we cannot do this. And yet it is happening. Romans 11:23. and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. Don't get proud. Don't get cocky. Walk with God. Serve God. Trust God. Live for God. And one day, Israel's going to get grafted back in again. God has a prophetic plan for them. Now let's see if we can make a couple of applications about life on this. And uh, we could make individual applications, like make sure you don't deny God. Make sure you walk with God. Make sure you don't live in the customs of this world. Make sure you don't accept things that are contrary to the will and way of God. That would affect what I think. That would affect what I watch, where I go, how I live, what I believe. But let's look at it more from a national perspective, because that's the perspective in which the, the, uh, the apostle is speaking. So let's look at some national implications that might affect us. There's a great argument going on in our land, whether we have been built upon biblical principles or whether our founding fathers were mostly pagan and didn't really believe the word of God. I can never figure out the argument because if you do any study of the founding fathers, the one thing you'll become convinced of is most of them were at least deists and many, many were Christian. There were a few non-believers, but not many. Our founding fathers founded this nation with the principle of teaching the word of God to people. That was the, the purpose of of many of the things they did in the early stages of our nation. I have here a primer. This primer was introduced to our country in 1690. Does that go back a couple years? 1690. This was the first elementary school primer. I have a, This is a photocopy. It's, in other words, they photographed all the pages of the original one. It's very hard to read because they made letters differently and they spelt phonetically. I would have done really good in that day. But here's what happened. They copied it, and this was used to teach schools, first grade, second grade, third grade. And this was to teach people who couldn't read the alphabet. And so you have this primer that was, was uh, done in 1777. When did our nation get its independence? 1776? So is this an indication of where we are as a nation? Let's see what they were teaching. Here's how they taught the alphabet. A, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. Anything biblical there? B, heaven to find the Bible mind. C, Christ crucified for sinners died. D, the deluge drowned the earth around. There's your flood. E, Elijah hid by raven's feed. F. The judgment made Felix afraid. This was the early primer that they used in schools. Does that sound Christian to you? Sounds pretty Christian to me, doesn't it? And, and this was the founding and the basis of much of what took place in our nation. Oh yeah, there was always resistance to the gospel, but the majority of people accepted the word of God. And when you read this book, you say, oh my goodness, this is a little primer on the Bible. And this is what they taught kids in elementary school. You wish they would teach it again. You know why? We went from chewing gum to gangs. We went from chewing gum to, to, to drugs and premarital sex and everything else you could imagine because they did not have this drilled upon, upon them. When I was a kid in school, they had the Ten Commandments on the wall. Think about this. Kid cheats on the test. Maybe if he heard, thou shalt not steal, that might change his thinking. And so this was the foundation of, of our nation. And it's important for us to understand that little by little, that's slipping away. But part of the reason it's slipping away is Christian parents are not impressing their children with the gospel so they understand the word of God and they can apply it in their daily walk, in their daily life. And it's important that they do that. Because if we do not, we will lose this nation. 
And, and I'm sad to say that just 40 years ago, the majority of people in this country would be in church on Sunday. That number is dramatically falling every year. Churches are shrinking. Many of them are shrinking because they've walked from the gospel. And they are closing in great numbers in this country. Why? Because people are not believing the word of God. And we need to believe it and proclaim it in an unshamed manner in a fallen world. Now, another indication of our nation's heritage was the Capitol building. Let's say that I went to Washington, D.C., and I said, I have a great idea. Why don't we start using the, 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 the big center of the Capitol building? Why don't we just start using that for worship services? Wouldn't this be a great place to have a worship service? What do you think? How far would that go? What, what hearing would it get out of? Wouldn't even get first page first base. Wouldn't get it. But did you know what? Our Capitol building used to be used as a church. Did you know that? And, and it's kind of interesting. And you know why they started using the Capitol building as a church? Because the politicians of that day said, there's no churches in the area. We have to provide a place for people to worship God. Oh, we just built the Capitol building. Here's a great idea. Let's open up the Capitol building for worship services. And then that's what they did. 1803, the U.S. Senator John Quincy Adams says there's no church. But three years before, he confirmed that, three years before, Congress, Congress approved the use of the Capitol building as a church building, December 4th, 1800. Can you imagine that? If we tried to do that today, go to City Hall and say, let's hold. Well, they got that nice, I, when I first came to town and we were starting the church, I went to a City Hall town meeting and I said, this would be great for a worship service. What do you think the chances of that are? And so something's changed in our nation. You know, the approval of the Capitol for church was given by both the House and Senate, with the House approval being given by Speaker of the House, Theodore Sedgwick, and the Senate approved it, given by the President of the Senate, which would be the Vice President, Thomas Jefferson, who had already been voted to be the President of the United States. And they said, let's use, and now Thomas Jefferson, don't you always hear that Jefferson was a sort of, didn't care about God or anything like that? Yet he approves, because he knows the direction of the nation, he approves that the Capitol building can be used for worship services. How far we've come as a nation and how much we need to be aware of what we're losing. And it's important that we as Christians be not ashamed of the gospel. Well, then one day, Congress uh, decided we don't have Bibles for our nation. We need to teach our nation the word of God. See, in those days, the only Bibles that anybody in America had came from England. And so they wanted to make available the word of God to people. Did you know what they did? Believe it or not, and I have a uh, facsimile of it. They printed a Bible in 1782 to give out to the population, to give out to the people. This is, this is a copy of it. And, and it says inside of this particular scripture, let me get to that page. It says inside, as printed by Robert Atkin, and approved and recommended by the Congress of the United States of America in 1782. How many think the Congress would approve the printing of Bibles and to be distributed among the population today? What are the chances of that happening? What has changed? And I'll tell you what has changed. Those who believe this word have gotten entangled with the world. And they've gotten entangled with the gods of this world. And Christianity is struggling, not because the gospel isn't true, but because those who should be promoting the word of God are often silent and quiet and don't know the word of God sufficiently. How about this? The Supreme Court first ruled against public school prayer in 1962. 
62. I graduated in 1967. That means most of my life in public schools, guess what they did? Did you know they used to pray in the classroom? And not only did they pray, but the teacher often read a Bible passage. What's happened? How many, how many of you have prayer before class in public schools? The only thing the teacher prays for is vacation. The only thing. We don't have it. It's gone. What happened? What happened? Christians stopped living like Christians. The population starts drifting away, and the society changes. Let me ask you a question. How many think our society is safer, better, and more wholesome today than it was 50 years ago? Not true, is it? No. We are worse off, but here's why we're worse off. The people of God need to live boldly like the people of God and unashamedly declare the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you see what happened this week? Donald Trump chose somebody for the Office of Management and Budget, the second in command. His name was Russell Vault. And so, you know, they're having Senate hearings. Should he be conf confirmed or shouldn't he be confirmed? So listen to what is written. T John Tony Perkins wrote this article about it. Russell Vault, Donald Trump's choice for agency second in command, was in for a surprise yesterday when his confirmation was debated in the United States Senate. The conversation, which should have been about Vault's economic experience, turned fiercely personal thanks to Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. I felt a little pain on that one. Instead of being, uh, instead of big picture financials, the debate became a firefight over Vault's Christian faith. At, Christ, at, at issue was a column Vault wrote last year suggesting that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. Quoting the piece, Sanders launched his first missile. missile. Sanders, Muslims do not simply have a deficient theology. They do not know God because they have rejected Jesus Christ, his son, and they stand condemned. Do you believe that statement is Islamophobic? Vault, absolutely not, Senator. I am a Christian, and I believe a Christian set of principles based on my faith. Sanders, forgive me. We just don't have a lot of time. Do you believe people in the Muslim religion stand condemned? Is that your view? Vault, again, Senator, I am a Christian, and I wrote that piece in accordance with the statement of, the, of faith at Wheaton College. Sanders, I understand that. I don't know how many Muslims there are in America, maybe a couple million. Are you suggesting that these people stand condemned? What about the Jews? Do they stand condemned too? Vault, Senator, I am a Christian. Sanders shouting now at the top. I understand that you are a Christian, but this country is made up of, of, of people who are not just. I understand that Christianity is the majority religion, but there are other people of different religions in this country and around the world. In your judgment, do you think that people who are not Christian are going to be condemned? Vault, thank you for probing on that question. As a Christian, I believe that all individuals are made in the image of God and are worthy of dignity and respect regardless of their religious beliefs. I believe that as a Christian, that's how I should treat all individuals. Sanders, do you think that's respectful of other religions? I would simply say, Mr. Chairman, that this nominee is really not someone who this country is supposed to be about. I dare Bernie Sanders to say that to a Muslim candidate for an office. What do you think would happen? You see, this, this Christian handled it with grace and dignity. But this is where you and I need to say, no turning back. No turning, either Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through him, or we're all wasting time. It's that simple. And we need to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And we need to be aware that we lose our liberties when we stop 
being Christian, when we are not living a vibrant, holy Christian life in the world, and we're not influencing people around us concerning the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we lose influence one person at a time, and the nation little by little becomes more and more pagan. From a personal aspect, it, it could be what you watch on TV, what you invest in, what you'll be involved with in life, and, and what you consider God, because some people say God is my God, but they worship many other things on the side, whether it be power, money, prestige, position. And God is not the very core and center and only one they worship. And we need to be aware of that. Here's what my prayer is. One day we'll see true revival of faith in our land that we won't end up like Israel. And it's a mistake to think it can't happen. We say, well, the United States is the most powerful, strongest nation on earth. Earth's a pretty big place. And we need to be aware that God's in control. And we need to call on the name of the Lord. Romans chapter 11, verse 19. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. God will not allow a people to continually walk from him. He will not allow a nation to go into debauchery without bringing judgment upon that nation. Our nation is a nation that is slipping into debauchery. But one of the reasons is Christians are not skillful, careful to share their faith and to live their faith. In a couple of weeks, I'll be sharing with you our new class on tactics, how to talk to people about difficult topics and share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope to see many of you there because we are in a spiritual battle and you cannot win it without preparation and knowing who you are in Christ. But I tell you this, we are on the winning side. We are serving the living God. Let's continue to do so. Let's bow before him. Lord, help us not to become like Israel, to faithfully declare the word of God. As complicated as our nation can be, the word of God is simple. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Help us to live it and do it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you.